Dr. Rand, welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, good to have you again. Excellent. So um, I wanted to, we, we, we're having you on to talk about a segment of what you guys do at Regenerative um, that does not include uh, the hormone therapy. Um, it's something that we're all very interested in and we have a lot of questions. But before we do, I did want to ask you about some uh, myths around testosterone that keep popping up whenever I bring up testosterone replacement therapy. I'll get messages and people will ask me about certain things in regards to testosterone. Is, well, that could take an entire show. Oh, I know. It could. <laughs> yeah. right. But there's some big ones out there. Like one of them is, uh, and I, you still hear this one, is that testosterone makes people angry or uh, <laughs> aggressive in a negative way. So let's talk about that for a second. Okay. That's an easy one because, uh, you know, the word I use with testosterone most often is leverage. It leverages everything you're doing. So, you know, it's why people can't just take testosterone and look like Schwarzenegger, for example. You still got to do the work, right? So what I will say, and I won't mention uh, what I normally mention in practice just because this is going to go places and we don't get want to get sued. But, you know, we've heard of certain athletes, let's say, who uh, have taken anabolic steroids. And, and by the way, there are some anabolic steroids, like halitestin, for example, and guys who have taken it will go, yeah, I know what you're talking about, that have a profile that tends to lead to aggressiveness, okay? Okay. Um, but, but that's for, not testosterone. Right. That's not testosterone. Right. And for the most part, well, I should probably throw Anadrol in there, but it's because of um, uh, there's something that, that, that mimics the estrogen um, agonist, okay? Um, and, and that's cutting to the chase. That's what it's all about. It's too much estrogen that makes you feel moody and irascible. So when guys are in the gym and you see them, uh, you know, they've gone uh, from a super nice guy to a jerk. That's how John Mayer would say it, baddie. I'm really into him now. You better be okay with it. You know, they put on 30 pounds in three months and half of it looks like it's in their face. They're holding so much water, right? Where will you look at me? <laughs> so see estrogen it, that does that? Bitchy. Okay, so, yeah. then, right? so then theoretically, Maybe part of the reason why some people report that is because they're not managing their estrogen levels very no. very well. They're, they're going to high doses because they're doing it black market. They're taking testosterone. They're not managing their est estrogen levels. Maybe they're not taking their shots consistently or the right dose for them, and their estrogen levels are rising. So maybe they they are reporting something that they do actually feel, but it's not because they're managing it properly or they're not managing it properly. Absolutely. First okay. of all, testosterone is the feel good hormone. They used to use it in the 1950s for ladies, by the way. There's a big study where they, well, I shouldn't say a big one, but I think it was at least 50 individuals where they treated depression. Okay. We didn't have serotonin re reuptake inhibitors back then, but they successfully treated depression in females. And I say that because, you know, the, even today people think, well, testosterone is for guys only, right? <laughs> okay. We know better than that. But um, it's, it's a feel-good hormone. And if you see some of the guys that are doing it right in the gym, not just because they're gigantic, not that just because you're gigantic, you can kick someone's ass, but, you know, they, they feel pretty comfortable in their skin and they're walking around, they're like big bears, right? If they're doing it properly. The guy we're talking about is like I described, you know, and you can tell they're puffy and they're, they're angry for no reason. And that's because their estrogen's out of control, whether it's because they're not dosing it properly, they're not dosing it at all, or I think you alluded to it, uh, they're getting bootleg stuff and who knows what you're getting in, in that situation. So they might think they're dosing themselves, but they're not. But what I was going to say earlier is, you know, if you're already a jerk to begin with, and we can think of a particular baseball player who got in trouble for it, you know, <laughs> and not one of my patients, but, um, you know, played volleyball with him when I was in Florida, you know, look, some people are jerks to begin with. And you give them more energy to be who they are. Well, that's the it's leveraging really effect. Okay, was he was he an asshole on the volleyball court too? <laughs> was he really that guy? I've always wondered if he's really that guy or not like that because he comes off that way. Everyone's everyone. Well, you know what? I mean, I, God, God bless him. You know, personalities. Uh, you know, there's so much now that's uh, what you're born with, and and you know, still no excuse. I mean, you should overcome some of the things that are innate, I guess. But whatever the my, my point is that not to pick on anybody really, uh, but just to give an example, um, you know, it's going to make you more of who you are. So, but, but estrogen is different. It can turn you from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde, hmm. no doubt. And we've all seen those guys in the gym, right? Mm -hmm. The guy I mentioned. So yeah, you got to govern estrogen. It's not testosterone that's doing that. Now with dihydrotestosterone, I would say there's a difference if, if you don't control that and not everyone has to. Matter of fact, some people have problems when they control their their uh, conversion to excess dihydrotestosterone, but I would say that tends to make you a little bit more 
uh, edgy, but not necessarily irritable. And I don't mean to mince words or, you know, get into too much semantics, but there is a difference, you know, and some people go, wow, I speak up at work now and, and I didn't before. So the edginess can be a good thing, but you know, irascibility is what we're talking about. Yeah. Moodiness, irascibility with excess estrogen. Yeah, and not to mention that the, the guy in the gym doing this is probably taking doses five to 10 times higher than what a replacement therapy dose would be, right? Bodybuilder doses are not the same as replacement doses. Thus, you're going to get larger conversions to estrogen. Right. No matter and, what you take. Yes. Well, not yes. only that, but there's such a huge individual variance with everybody and how they respond to these things. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so glad you said this because I actually didn't know that. I, I And my response when people would say that about testosterone is I'd say, listen, if you're an asshole and you take testosterone, you just become a bigger asshole. Like, that's how I'd say it. It's, yep. not, it's not the testosterone that's doing that. But I didn't realize that estrogen could play a big role in that. And I actually think that's actually probably one of the more common things where these people that are taking it black market that aren't having a, a doctor yeah. watch it, they probably are not balancing their estrogen. And I, the reason why I say that, as I speak from experience, that's one of the things that you guys have constantly had to manage with me is my my estrogen levels are real. I'm very sensitive. And so you guys have messed with my, my dosing and stuff like that several times to trying to get it to that sweet spot. So... Uh, yeah, I would have never, low. I would have never been able to do that on my own. I've tried to do things like that on my own, but it wasn't. Yeah, and and estrogen He's been a lot too, less moody. Too, estrogen so. can be too low. Yeah, I know. He's a lot. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Explains yeah. a lot right now. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's all making sense. Yeah, and, and, and two things. One is that one of the symptoms of low testosterone is irritability. So that's I've I've read that. And it can then, throw off your mood. Yeah. And one of the symptoms of low estrogen because estrogen can be too high or too low, yeah. and both of them will make you feel pretty crappy. Yeah, typically in different ways, although there is some individual difference uh, as usual in medicine. Uh, for example, with elevated estrogen, some people, it can uh, uh, mess with their libido in a, in a bad way. Some people in what you would consider a good way. In other words, it elevates it. Mm. So there are some differences individually, but there are some rare few that uh, when you, when you over-suppress estrogen, have issues with uh, libido and erectile function, along yeah. with some of the other signs and symptoms uh, that include joint you know, pain, kind of too. the achy joints. Yeah, yeah. So for those people, I mean, there's a sweet spot I call it for estrogen, about 15 to 20 picograms per milliliter, because we find that the the free testosterone comes up a little bit because you've lowered SHBG. Um, but for someone who's sensitive to that drop, and remember, it's not going to be perfect the whole uh, yeah. time period between dosage. So we have to float it up a little higher. Um, and sometimes that affects the amount of free tea. And if it does negatively, then we just add a little bit more of the, the total to get an absolute value going higher rather than a percentage. But uh, the point is, yeah, we have to manage those patients a little differently because of that sweet spot concept rather than just- Well, this has been me. So you, I know Dr. Todd handles a lot of my, my labs and I, I have a lot, a lot of conversations with him more than I do you. But this has been me. It's like uh, finding that perfect sweet spot. I'm also very sensitive to uh, gynecomastia, or if I say that right, I don't know if I'm saying yep. that right. Yep. Um, and so if we if we don't suppress it, then it spikes that up. If we suppress it, it goes too low. Then I had joint pain. So we really had to to play with the Arimidex and my dose. Like he's changed the me. timing of the dose is important too. Because yes. remember, you've got everyone thinks it's just even tighter that you keep. No, you've got a, a just like when you eat. Uh, you know, a meal, you're going to have a spike in blood sugar and come back yeah. down. You're not going to notice that big spike. Most of us, um, the same thing happens with testosterone, but on a weekly basis. Yeah. So, you know, we're pretty aggressive at, at, at our place about, you know, making sure we would err if we're going to err at all on the side of over suppressing estrogen, because that's easy to fix. And gynecomastia is not right. Right. So, you know, we can just pull off, uh, you know, one, one dose of one milligram of anastrozole and things will change in four days. That's exactly what you guys did. You guys had me on two, then we pulled back to one. And that's been like the sweet spot for me. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway. The RGB bundle, the most popular bundle we have. MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. You can get it for free, but you have to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you win, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won and then you get free access to the RGB bundle. Also, we have a sale going on right now. Skinny Guy Bundle, 50% off. That includes all these programs. And the Fit Mom Bundle is 50% off. And that includes all these other programs, both half off. If you want to take advantage, click on the link at the top of the description below to get our discount. One more thing, in this episode, we have Dr. Randon talking about peptides. We put something together with him and his team 
for our listeners. So if you're interested in peptides, the science, what they could do for you, and you want to have it doctor supervised, go to mppeptide.com. All right, here comes the show. And yeah. what's really interesting too is, and not to get too far into the weeds, stop no, it's me, okay. but, but, yeah. but you know, there's, there's estradiol, which is what we're measuring, uh, estradiol sensitive, because uh, it's precise enough to be accurate, but the others are not, by the way. I think we talked about that before. But um, uh, estrone is something that can be elevated, and it's, it's rare, but we've seen it because we're like, hey, wait, we've got this guy nailed in terms of the sweet spot, and yet we're still having problems with gynecomastia. And then there's just the the ones where you go, okay, there's almost, I mean, there's always going to be an explanation. We just can't figure out what it is yet. But we've made a topical serum so that, you know, like tamoxifen. Oh, wow. So that if someone, you know, is is uh, is is one of those guys that has to find that sweet spot, it's hard to find, in other yeah. words, right? It's a little higher than normal. And they're getting nipple sensitivity. Well, we don't want to change it systemically, but we can apply a topical a blocker. Oh, wow. Right? So it's not getting as much absorbed systemically, but it's going I didn't know they had a breast. topical serum. That's, that's, I had no idea. Yeah, and Power Pharmacy, I think they're the first ones to come up with it. Uh, that's, a, well, that's a short story. I used to work with APS, and one of the guys there, uh, David Bruce, uh, transferred over to uh, Empower with Sean Norian, who runs the place. And uh, they've been really good about, you know, well, before we could do a lot with compounders. Now the regulations really clamp down on what you can do. It used to be what it was supposed to be, which is, okay, can't figure this out. There's nothing out there that's in the right dose, right combination. We can tinker and make our own stuff. Got it. Now it's almost, yeah, well, not almost. It's definitely overly regulated, but they can still come up with things if they're willing to invest the money. And this was one of them they came up with, a topical, because it makes sense for guys that have an issue and you're left with, uh, you know, tinkering ad infinitum, um, were, hey, let's just put out the fire. And, and it is great to put out the fire immediately. And by the way, uh, on that note, if you ever experience that uh, gynecomastia or, or you know what we think is that in nipple sensitivity, that's the, the go-to, a CIRM, because it blocks the receptor. It gets in there and blocks it right away rather than you know waiting for the estrogen to dissipate, to metabolize, Got it. because it's already, you know, any more further uh, blockers of conversion from testosterone to estrogen is great, but what about what's already there? Well, you get a, a blocker in there right away. So when uh, when people you know call up and say, uh, hey, I think I'm feeling a little nipple sensitivity, we'll get them on the tamoxifen typically, a CIRM, immediately. And then we can tinker with the anastrozole dose. But this goes back to you know the whole idea about estrogen – uh, regulation. I, I still don't know. And, and again, I'll avoid naming names here, but there's a Stanford associate professor maybe or something has no clinical background as far as I know. Uh, and then there's another trainer out there claiming that, uh, you know, you should never block estrogen. Even one of my good friends, uh, although he's, he's uh, in the middle ground, I think now Nelson Virgil, uh, who, who's a great guy, um, is understanding that there, there, there are definitely some, uh, some individuals who need estrogen control. But one of these guys claims it's all from progesterone excess, which makes absolutely no sense. Uh, but it's leading to a lot of gynecomastia and a lot of bad haircuts that I got to fix later. Or somebody's <laughs> got to fix because yeah. of this idea. I don't know where it's coming from, but maybe because there are some people is what I'm getting to where yeah. they go, wait a minute, I, I control my estrogen like I'm being told and the wheels fall off the wagon. Well, it's just because we haven't found the sweet spot yeah. that we need to look for. And it's not often that you run into guys like that, but it's often enough where, yeah, it's definitely something we have to treat and be aware of. You know what this really highlights is uh, th that what you want is a place where they really pay attention to the stuff because you're going to get testosterone from here, testosterone from there, but the key is figuring out what works for you as an individual. And there's quite a large individual variance yep. between people because we are taking hormones, right? If you are on hormone ther therapy, you're taking hormones. That doesn't guarantee you're going to feel great because you got to figure out how it works for your body. And the, the person that does that is your doctor, the person that's working with you. Because there are places that, okay, here's your prescription and now you're off on your own type well, of Well, first let me correct something I just said. I realized I said progesterone. This this person from Stanford mentions prolactin. Prolactin, I'm sorry. That's, that's right. That's not, not – either way, um, not the problem. It's, it's excess estrogen. But to your point, um, yeah, it's not so much that – I mean, it's not a Gaussian curve. It's more like this. Most people fit into this, this steep area underneath the curve. Sure. But there are enough of the outliers is a better – more exact way of putting it – 
that you got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most people do fit into this nice, nice, neat little area of the curve, but there are a bunch of people out here that you got to go, well, we got to change things up because of your individual. Well, that's nature. been me. It's yeah. been absolutely. You got, yeah. I mean, working with you guys has been paramount to the success I've had with HRT because I've, I've been a headache with ba balancing that out. If it wasn't <laughs> for you guys, I would have never figured it yeah. out. Now, uh, what about, um, the the when people say well well taking testosterone that's bad for your prostate you, you shouldn't you shouldn't take testosterone low testosterone is better than high testosterone because of the prostate well i believe that came from a very flawed study back in i think it was 1942 where they um had three people two of whom in hindsight should have been excluded from the study uh that developed prostate cancer i believe i'm i'm citing the right study um, but that dogma continued for what, 70, 80 years. Um, bottom line is now we, and that's not a good study, obviously an N of three no. isn't an N of one certainly isn't, but, uh, <laughs> certainly underpowered to say the least. But, uh, what we now realize is it looks like just like with breast cancer, uh, any estrogen sensitive cancer, as a matter of fact, there's been a test for a long time that's used namely for women. Uh, a 216 alpha hydroxy estrone test. Remember we were talking about estrones earlier. Yeah. Th those, that category contains at least two that we know are bad. There's the the 16 alpha hydroxy estrone and the four hydroxy estrone that we know contribute to uh, estrogen sensitive cancers. They activate the genes for them. Okay, and in men, believe it or not, don't shoot the messenger guys, but we all have the genes for prostate cancer. When I was going through med school, I remember in Grand Round, someone was given a presentation. And they said, uh, every man in the U.S. today at age 82 has uh, prostate cancer. And first of all, whenever you hear every, always, never in medicine, you go, whoa, whoa hold the phone. What, yeah. you know, <laughs> come on. Because there's always an exception, right? <laughs> well, not in this case, apparently. Uh, now, I don't know if the number's skewed to 81 or 83 at this point, but think about that for a second. Now, it doesn't get a lot of popular press. Why? Because the life expectancy, I think, today for men is 78. Mm -hmm. It's a slow-growing cancer. So the smarter doctors, urological oncologists typically, will say, whoa, whoa, let's do what they call watchful waiting. Let's see what happens. Let's monitor it, ideally with what they call a multi-parametric MRI. So you're visualizing... The, the lesion, and you can see, is it close to the edge of the prostate or not? So is there a risk of metastases? Uh, if it's growing quickly, we might consider getting a, a biopsy to make sure that it's, uh, well, to, to see how aggressively it might be uh, uh, growing based on histology. But anyway, if it's slow growing, you go, okay, I'm going to die of something else if you're the typical male, okay? And again, we go back to individual, individual decision-making. But um, it looks like, Estrogen is the culprit to get to the answer to your question. Once you have prostate cancer, once those genes have been activated by one of those estrones, typically, then we know that uh, dihydrotestosterone adds fuel to the fire. So you definitely want to pull back. You, you want to stop the conversion from testosterone into really arguably any dihydrotestosterone. The problem with that is, and the reason why we want to avoid cancer, <laughs> duh, uh, all together in the first place is because for some people that can be a problem. Now on the internet, it's all over the place. Any five alpha reductase inhibitor, which is finasteride, also known as Propecia yeah. and, and Dutasteride, right? Dutasteride is Avidar. They're in the same family. Okay. Uh, those are known to effectuate erectile dysfunction in some people. Now on the internet, it's going to look like everybody's grandmother gets it. Well, grandmother, no, but grandfather gets it. <laughs> right. um, because people post the negative stuff on the internet. In my practice, I've seen some people, but a very small percentage affected negatively by a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. But what if you're one of those people? So you definitely want to avoid it. Um, and uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting yeah. too far off topic here, but uh, you know, 97% of people who are diagnosed early enough with prostate cancer uh, can resolve it or survive it, however you want to put it. Uh, so there's no excuse to really, to, very little excuse to die of prostate cancer these days, but it, it takes monitoring it. And this brings up a whole other topic about how to do so. A digital rectal exam is ridiculous. I mean, we're all athletes here, right? Mm. <laughs> how many times you got to take a swing at the baseball before you're good at it? Everyone would say 10,000 swings, right? You think that proctologist has done that or urologist, whomever it is, is checking your prostate 10,000 times? I doubt it. <laughs> I did it 
you know, maybe five times I when I was, you know, <laughs> in, in, in residence. Yeah, was that? Yeah, I said, I don't want to sign up for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. no well, and, and, and it's, it's worthless too, in the sense that unless it's grossly abnormal, which is going to reflect, you're you know, advanced tell. cancer, yeah. you're not going to pick it up with the edge of your longest finger, you know, with a glove on, et cetera. So a multi-parametric MRI is something that visualizes a lesion as small as, as three millimeters. That might be maybe a million cells. That's nothing, but it's early enough to detect it and treat it if necessary. Yeah, I you hear that, Doug? You don't need to be doing it every week anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think the confusion. Self comes, I think the confusion comes from when you have prostate cancer. Then they look at things like it DHT changes the game, to, for yes. sure. But that's a different context, right? Like, uh, like people will say, "Oh, protein activates uh, mTOR, uh, and mTOR can drive cancer." Well, if you have cancer, if you mm -hmm. don't have cancer, mm -hmm. it's actually in what feeds cancer. Pretty much everything: carbohydrates, proteins, right. even fats. Well, you just opened up a big Pandora's box with a whole thing about anti aging and mTOR because. I'm in your camp yeah. in the sense that, you know, I argue, and I'm being very, very general now, but, you know, with growth hormone, uh, mTOR activation, like you're talking about, if you're not exercising, if you're riding a desk, then it makes sense. I mean, it's like throwing a bunch of, uh, I don't know, just riffing here, a bunch of food on the floor. Eventually the bacteria are going to take over. You're going to have a mess, you know, but if you're exercising, right? And you're using up the extra energy, the potential for things to get out of control. And by the way, you need the reparative functions, right. regenerative functions of mTOR, then I don't see the problem as much. Now, and we're trying to jigger it, okay? And it yep. gets a little too complex and I won't go into too much, but mTOR is, 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 is the moniker we use for really two complexes, mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two. With what we've researched so far, yes, we do want to minimize uh, mTORC1 because of its effect on the body and making, cleaning up the mess that we made in the kitchen, accidentally dropping stuff on the floor, just the stuff that happens because we're, we're using the kitchen. Autophagy, right? Mm -hmm. We want to activate that. It, it keeps things in order. But mTORC2, it looks like, which is also part of mTOR deactivation, right? Works the opposite, it looks like. So we got to figure out a way to, to tamp down on mTORC1 without... Uh, M, uh, tamping down to mTORC2 or maybe even ramping up mTORC2 and mTORC2 can be activated. Uh, oh, I told you I wasn't going to do this. So I'll stop here, but just one more <laughs> statement. But It's okay. That's why know, we have you here is to go deep. It's if we right. can like use rapamycin, <laughs> yeah. this is just theory, by the way, guys, uh, but current theory suggests that uh, you can have a thousand fold decrease in mTORC1, but if you can maybe combine rapamycin use with say something that activates growth hormone to maybe a, a smaller fraction, you can change the balance. So you still get some mTORC2 activation, which we've shown it's is necessary. Yeah. It's a positive thing, right? Yeah. While decreasing mTORC1 to get the best of both worlds. And we'll probably find, no, not probably, we will definitely find, I'm an eternal optimist. We'll find the right drug that does that eventually. Rapamycin is not ideal. Rapamycin, by the way, is um, a drug that affects, well, ostensibly affects immune function. It's been used for like kidney transplant uh, uh, individuals. Um, but it looks very promising in the study of anti-aging because of its effect on mTOR. Okay, I'll yeah. stop there. Yeah, I think if, you, if you're <laughs> signaling growth, pro-growth factors, but you're not sending a signal to grow things like muscle and bone, it's going to be used in different ways, right? So it's like those. It's like when in the '80s when we told all the women to take calcium, but nobody did any weight-bearing exercise, so they just ended up with calcium deposits in their arteries, for example. Or worse than that, constipation all or the time, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, back to the prostate. I've I've seen studies that show that low testosterone is correlated to increases in yeah. prostate cancer. Sorry, that's where this started. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just. Get me That's back okay. in no <laughs> you're, you're addressing really, really interesting. Like, I didn't know that about men, mTOR. Did you know that? Yeah, no, I did not know there was two. two. No, no. Yeah, yeah. So that's well, fascinating. There is a correlation between low testosterone. And again, I'm using the word carefully, correlation. And I'll come back to that in a second. Between low testosterone, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, mm -hmm. and osteoporosis. Correlation because, yeah, we're dealing with the masses Correlation doesn't sh show cause and effect. I think everybody in this room is highly unlikely, unless there's something I don't know about, to have or contract any of those things, sure. except if you live long enough with prostate cancer because of what I just said. I think there's ways to ameliorate that, at least you know, increase the time before we get prostate cancer. But type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, how are you going to get osteoporosis when you're training like you do every day? So 
yeah, there's a correlation, but is it likely in you guys? No, but there are also other benefits to using testosterone for obvious reasons and maximizing or optimizing, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, just quality you know, of life. Quality of life, yeah. Health span, we call it. Not not just longevity, but the quality of that time. That's, so, a, that's a very good point because I want to stop you there. So, you, you, you know, living till you're 90 versus living great till your 90s. Very different. I've known a lot of people in their 90s. Well, I'd rather live great to 87 than to barely get to 90 well, and yeah. be struggling for 20 well, years, the, the, right? Was it like our healthcare costs, uh, like the vast majority of it's like the last five years of our life because mm -hmm. you're just, you're just, you're not able to do anything. You have to have, you know, caretakers and, or you could be functional, independent and feel good up until, you know, the day you die. Well, David Sinclair, an anti-aging guy, uh, you know, he makes the point that a lot of us don't think about too even though it's a relatively short period, we're talking about a long period where we're sort of declining into death. Even, you know, we'd all like to, I believe, and by the way, I've never met anybody who wouldn't make that change, right. that trade, excuse me. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it can be a painful last few moments if you're in poor health. You'd rather just have your heart stop ticking, sure, right? right? It just right. runs out of beats rather than, you know, um, you know, have a stroke and, and, and slowly, you know, melt away over a couple of days or whatever. It's painful. And, 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 uh, Sinclair makes that point again. I think more to our point is 20 years of, of misery is sucks period. I mean, why, why would you want to go through that? And that's hopefully motivation for certainly our audience, right. To, mm -hmm. to be proactive about it. Do you it. think in our lifetime, we're going to see like the one twenties, one thirties. What do you think? You think in our, you think, we're, we're, we're getting there in medicine. You mean the masses? I mean, because we do have- uh, Right, right. There's outliers, right? That's, you know, yeah. Well, what's the oldest we've seen? 125, I think, was the oldest? Clement yeah. was 122. 122. She's okay. the oldest, yeah. Okay. Uh, we had one recently, 117. They like, tend to be gals. Uh, they tend to be smaller individuals. I was, you know, I, I quote uh, Lou Ferrigno um, often enough because he was talking to a friend of mine, um, Scott in the gym. Who, Scott's like, you know, 315 pounds and- and Lou thought that Scott was trying to get even bigger. It was giving him a hard time. And, and anyway, the, the upshot of it was, Scott, how many old guys do you know that are big? <laughs> Think about that for a second, guys. Yeah. yeah. I don't know Not anybody me. who's huge that made it to 100. These the centenarians tend to be relatively small. It's easier on the body, right? It makes yeah, sense. Totally. Um, and there's too few of them really to, to get a great sense of what this, the special sauce is for centenarians. But that seems like a pretty basic one, even if we don't have, I don't know, whatever kind of study you want to uh, call it, you know, look around. The people that tend to live the longest are like my mom, you know, 5'3 mm -hmm. and 104 pounds. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when you think about like all the biohacking, <coughs> the anti-aging <coughs> medicine that's coming out, like the, what, we're, what we're learning – uh, even on the nutrition aspect, like, do you think that we're actually extending or do you think what a lot of the stuff that we're doing is just improving quality of life? I think we're just preventing death. I don't know if it's necessarily improving quality of life a whole lot. What, what do you mean? Well, a lot of the drugs and stuff that people take now, medications, uh, they're just sick, but they're not dead. You know, uh, with with some of the medications. Oh yeah, you're talking about. I'm talking about like uh, more like optimizing stuff. Yeah, that's right? a whole that's a whole different. Yeah. yeah, I think it's an arguable point. I think the way it was presented, because yeah, I mean, who's to say? I mean, God, I think of somebody like Stephen Hawking, who's just the ultimate champion. I I can't even imagine being trapped in your body like yeah. that, uh, and yet he lived to pretty ripe old age and was. I, I, ostensibly anyway, pretty happy. Most of us would be like, hey, if I'm trapped like that, put me out of my misery. Am I right? right? I mean, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. so to what degree is quality of life stymied enough? I don't know the answer to that question. But yeah, I think what we're finding now is certainly, I think last year, and God knows if it was related to COVID or not, but you know, we, we lost a year in terms of um, longevity. Uh, so we haven't really made a whole lot of gains in the last uh, decades. Oh, we we went back a little bit. We went back by one year from what I read. Oh, interesting. But uh, for men, anyway. Um, but going forward, I think we've definitely gained more strides, I think, to your point, in quality of life along the way, because we found better ways, for example, just to deal with diabetes. Sure. You know, we were kind of that's limping true. along with, with just insulin, and now we have so many more drugs. Just, that's just one disease. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right? And, and that's, you know, what I focused on. I mentioned uh, the book I was, uh, that I finished, actually, finally. Uh, going forward, we've got a lot of techniques to, to write the health of an individual that such, you know, by, by default, you would think would also extend their life. I mean, if you've got diabetes, let's face it, 
you know, even if it's well controlled, your longevity is going to be an issue compared to the normal individual. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, that brings up another can of worms. Um, what was interesting in the metform some of the metformin studies, and I, I'll leave this alone too, but, um, you know, uh, those that didn't have diabetes and took metformin, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget it now, but uh, anyway, controlling, let's just say this, controlling your sugars period is good for you. Uh, and lowering and for different mechanisms than just lowering your sugar, there's AMP activation, et cetera. But um, uh, at the end of the day, if you can use this autophagy concept, I was talking mm -hmm. about cleaning up the mess, uh, you're more likely to run better than if you don't. And um, certainly the implication is if you're taking care of the kitchen, cleaning up the messes that the kitchen is going to last longer too. Sorry, I went kind of roundabout there. I'm just trying to make a simple. And what point. You, well, what you mean, simple, even simpler, is you mean just having cleaner, healthier cells is what you're saying. Yeah, and, and it goes back to and, and David Sinclair does a pretty good job of this, and and not that I'm going to butcher it, but he uses a CD analogy. You've got data there, and 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 if you don't clean up the kitchen, as I like to say it, you don't clean up the cell. That data, the DNA, gets corrupted, and so call that the recipe for for the meals you're making in the cell. When the recipe gets corrupted, then you're making stuff that doesn't taste good, that doesn't work well, okay? So this autophagy process goes back and cleans up the DNA and writes the recipe, okay, so that things function properly. And part of that also gets rid of a bad recipe. Well, that's not the, the analogy is going to lose its power here. But, you know, if, if you can't fix the, the recipe in that cell, part of autophagy says, all right, well, then you're getting rid of the cell. We're going to get a replacement cell. And the beauty of that is, you know, think of it now to change analogies to a car. If the car hasn't been tuned properly, not only does it not run itself, that one cell's not running right, but it's spewing exhaust all over the place, toxic exhaust, and affects the cells around it. I know we're going way off topic mm -hmm. here, guys. I apologize. No, but, no you worries. Know, no, no, this is all no, good conversation. No, it's all great conversation. Yeah. Now, sure. what, what about, because um, you're seeing more and more women now go on testosterone replacement therapy, whereas before it was like testosterone? That's not, that's a man hormone. That, right. you know, why should women take that? That's going to make them turn into a man. But more and more women now are going into testosterone replacement and getting, I mean, great results. So how important is testosterone for women? We know that as being the male hormone, but is it also very important for women? And what are their signs and symptoms of low testosterone and optimizing for women? Is it similar? It's exactly the same, really. Uh, Again, I mentioned this study in the 1950s. When I first started practicing, I had way more female uh, clients, patients than I did men. Really? For whatever reason. And then, and I thought that was going to continue. And then, you know, there was a women's health initiative, which got into um, more estrogen replacement, okay, and dealing with symptoms of estrogen deficiency, hot flashes, night sweats. And I think there was some crosstalk there, some, some confusion, because first of all, the, the one really for me anyway, the one flaw in the study in the women's health initiative is that they used for the most part, they used progest, uh, sorry, um, Premarin as the estrogen replacement. Now I know we're talking about testosterone, mm -hmm. but you know, think about the, the, the average person in the public hormone replacement leads to stroke and cancer. You go, okay, well that, that, that encompasses all the hormones. No, right. it's estrogens and, and Premarin stands for pregnant mare urine. They're extracting estrogens from, horses, okay, and roughly not quite, uh, I think it's more 45%, but let's just call it half of that is equiline, which is a thousand times more potent on a human uterus than human estrogens like estradiol. Wow. So you wonder why we were having so many issues. And I think it was an increase of like um, eight and 10,000, if I'm getting that right, for both stroke and, and estrogen sensitive cancers wow. in the women who are using this. So my point is that that hormone replacement got a bad name. And so women started steering away from all the hormones, including testosterone. But to your point, yeah, there are still uh, not too many that I meet, but you know, I, I've got probably a, a, a unique swath that comes to my office uh, by the time they get there. But who, you know, women who think, oh, no, no, testosterone, and men too, who think testosterone's for men and estrogen's for women. But we share the same hormones, just different ratios. But what it treats is the same thing, libido, lack of energy, um, uh, good mood, body composition changes. And I harp on that one because personality can overcome the first three. <laughs> but body composition, that's something that I don't care how hard you try. 
and I see this over and over again, you know, the professional athletes, the former pros are the last ones to make it in because they, like you guys, know every trick in the book to jigger in that last little bit of fat off the body. And then they finally get to, you know, 55 or 60. They go, okay, screw it. I'm out of tricks. I mean, I'm tired of using them all. What's wrong? Well, we just got to put the leverage of testosterone it, back in. Is it, is it harder, easier, or the same to uh, balance uh, the women's hormones out when taking testosterone? Like, so if you get a client that's a female taking testosterone, do are they harder to balance? First of all, they're more fun. <laughs> uh, harder to balance. Why, why are they more fun? Oh, because they're, they're a little bit more tricky because you've got other hormones that affect gals. oh more fun for you because it's challenging is that what you're saying yeah okay. yeah yeah because okay. and, and you know you got uh progesterone and estrogen that play a bigger role to some degree in females because of the the uterus and the vagina than than in a male where you're just dealing with you know an excess of estrogen or deficiency causing some we'll call them uh you know mood issues with females you know you've got these hormones that it's not just about mood uh you know, the, the for example, the you know, tissue of the yeah. vagina is very friable. Yeah. So if we suffer a, a deficiency in, in estrogen for too long, it can it can ruin a lot of things, you know. I can't speak directly because I don't have a vagina, I yeah. promise. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, despite being accused. We, the jury, find the defendant. Dr. Ann. Not guilty of. No. <laughs> <laughs> On the playing field sometimes if I didn't, you know, make the victory. Your YouTube comments are brutal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Males are totally, yeah, brutal with one another, yeah. yeah. No, but um, the... Uh, uh, the, the bottom line is, you know, the hormone works the same for a male as it does a female. Roughly 10% of the male dose is used for a female. But um, I don't know, men, it's like, it's pretty easy because you just give them some testosterone and they're happy and their tails wagging like a dog and, and they, they, don't, they don't care about much else. With women, they like to fine tune it, I think, a little bit more often enough, at least in my practice. And with guys, I would say, and this is a generalization, you know, some of the side effects uh, that are possible aren't as noticeable. For example, we were talking about, you know, the source of prostate cancer. Well, prostate enlargement is furthered by dihydrotestosterone. If you live long enough, you're going to have uh, a scene out of, uh, what was it, uh, with Clint Eastwood, uh, Trouble with the Curve, where he's sitting there in the opening scene trying to urinate and, mm, cause, and, uh, and having a hard time because the prostate's grown so large. The prostate surrounds the, the urethra and, and uh, like a donut, it, you know, if you put it in coffee, it's going to swell outward but inward too, and it starts to choke off the, the, the passageway there, right? So a guy's not going to notice that till he's probably in his 70s on average. Um, women, I think, are more in tune to the possibility of acne, which is, uh, again, not from testosterone directly, but a metabolite, dihydrotestosterone. So we have to govern that more so with a female, with a male. Again, I'm generalizing here. Um, hair loss is a male's concern, but it's really driven by the way you chose your parents. So male pattern baldness, you might slow it down a little bit, or I guess better put, you might accelerate a little bit with exposure to dihydrotestosterone. The female, dihydrotestosterone, I mean, how many females do you know suffer from male pattern baldness. Yeah, Not very too many. rare, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they'll notice the hair loss a little bit more. So you got to be a little bit more careful in um, just being aware because again, it's all fixable. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part with females is they hear it's a possibility and they go, okay, I'm punting. I'm not even going to try this. Yeah, yeah. They go, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, if any of this stuff occurs, and I would say it happens in maybe 20%, again, it has to do with the way you chose your parents. We can go off of this and it'll all reverse. Okay, so what are, by the way, let's just state for the record what they are. Hair loss, acne, thickening of the vocal cords. And one of the fears that's not really justifiable is clitoral enlargement. Because getting back to what you said earlier, we're talking about bodybuilder dosages where right, you've got that right. much exposure, right? Yep. So. No yeah. Sorry, sounds you can like just you went to the fair. There's always <laughs> one asshole. <laughs> Warm. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, bodybuilder doses is a way different than what yeah, you guys are yeah. doing. And, yeah, and that's, that's part of the problem is because, again, the internet, for all its value, you know, that's one of the detriments is that there's misinformation out there and it's not explained well enough. But what I tell people, male or female, is you've got about a six-month window during which you can stop and it'll all reverse, whatever it is that's going on. For example, hair follicles, uh, they may drop a hair, and they do, by the way, naturally, but it won't get inflamed and damaged to the point where, where it won't regenerate a hair for at least six months. 
So if you go, okay, I'm noticing some hair thinning. Well, you can stop and it'll all come back. Or you can attack the culprit, which is the excess dihydrotestosterone, which is way more androgenic, uh, meaning having that same effect uh, on, on the hair follicle and the hair growth in the wrong places, et cetera. And you, you accomplish the same thing. And typically, I mean, it's classic, you know, I'll have explained this in the, in the intro. And if I get one of the 20% that comes in at the 90 day and they say, you know what, everything's going great, but I think I'm getting some of those hairs on my chin, you know, that my grandma had. And let me come back to that in a second, but I'll say, oh, well, remember we talked about that. Don't, don't panic. We can go off the, oh, wait, 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 before I can even finish the sentence. Well, I'm not going to go off it. Forget that. I'll just pluck it. Never mind. I forget I even brought it up. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Or we can use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride. And, uh, and this will segue into some of the things mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're offering, but um, finasteride uh, is, is what we call a type 2 inhibitor. And that works for the prostate for the most part, but also for the skin and hair a bit. And it's a good trial because if you're going to have side effects as a male or female with things like libido or erectile function for a male, uh, you'll know it with the dose of finasteride, which has a very short half-life, okay? But a stronger 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitor is dutasteride, which used to be called Avidart. Mm -hmm. And that works on type 1 and type 2 receptors and, and mainly the skin is mm -hmm. what we're looking at, right? And, and protects uh, male or female against those things. And, and so we, we win. But just a quick note about the hair, if I haven't said it before, but women forget, men too, Men and women have hair in the same places. Women just typically have a lot less of it, right? Mm -hmm. And grandma had the hair on her chin, if she's going to have any, you know, two or three over here when she was 30. It's just at 70, 75, she said, Screw stop, I'm not doing stop this giving a shit. I don't that. care. <laughs> and what that's what when you notice it. But ask any female if she's uh, got that, if she's willing to, to admit it. And if she should. It's just like us men hair in our ears. You know what I'm saying? Right now, when you're in your <laughs> early 40s, you're plucking in some of that. Probably about 60, you don't give a shit no more, right? Dude, I, you know, I, and I thought I dodged that bullet. I didn't know any better. But then about 38, it, all of a sudden, it's cropping up there. And I'm like, where did that stuff come from? It's genetic. And you either have it or you don't. Yeah, I have a friend, a uh, female friend who works with you guys. And she got a little, she started noticing a little bit of oily skin and I told the same thing. I said, well, you can go off. No, 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 no. I love the way I feel. My body mm -hmm. composition, everything's great. And then she managed it and now it's all the good. The take home is that we have a fix for it. And that's why we were talking before the it's show. It's part of the balancing process. Yeah. Love my job because there's an answer for everything and I can sleep great at night knowing that. We just got to get the word out so they don't suffer in silence or not even try because they go, well, you know, I've had actresses that go, I cannot think about having extra hair or worse, I guess, acne. They go, wait, you know, if I could just talk to him for a second, you know, we could do it prophylactically, meaning start with something that blocks the, the conversion to DHT and, and get that out of the way from the start. Now, how do you speak to any concerns like some women may have in terms of like exogenous testosterone? Um, and also they're trying to get pregnant or, you know, they're, they're trying to go through that process. Like, is that something that, you know, maybe you can consider later or is this something that is. Well, it's a great question. Depends upon, you know, the timing, obviously, yeah. you know, how old they are, if they're candidates for replacement therapy or not, but arguably, you know, getting prepared for pregnancy, if you've got a shortage of testosterone, it's, it's ideal to get on TRT. The uterus is a muscle after all, right? Mm. And being in great condition prior to pregnancy, I mean, in Chinese medicine, and I would argue in Western medicine too, I would agree, you know, if you do it properly, you can come out better uh, post-pregnancy than, you know, before pregnancy. Why? Because your body, a female's body is, is doing the best it can, releasing all the right hormones to develop the fetus. And if you take advantage of that, you're going along for the ride. You know, you don't abuse that. You don't stay up too late or don't, you know, work too hard or whatever while you're caring. You should come out ahead. But you definitely don't want to be on testosterone once pregnant. And I would argue that you want to plan ahead to be off testosterone for at least a month, preferably more like three months at least, so that your body uh, re-equilibrates its hormones so that when you get pregnant, you know, you start that journey clean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But in preparation for, and certainly afterwards, testosterone's great Thanks, not, if you need it. All right. So you guys offer a lot of other things aside from hormone replacement therapy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about peptides and some of the other products you guys offer. So what are, so I, from what I knew about peptides before I met you guys were, these were things that had real effects in the body but I'd see them be sold online in these kind of gray market, you know, 
uh, websites and they'd sell them like research chemicals and whatever. I said, you know, I don't want to mess with any of this stuff without any doctor supervision. These have real effects in the body. Then I met you guys and you guys do all that. First off, what are peptides? Yeah. Like, what are they? A little brief history of, you know, how they even found them. So, okay. Uh, I, I think we can pit it on insulin. Insulin is a peptide that, as you know, is required, not required, but certainly if you have type one diabetes, it's required for treatment. Type two, it can be an option if you get that far along. Insulin's a peptide. Um, it does wonders if you have diabetes, it can be a literal lifesaver. So I wanna say that was the first one that we studied and were able to make uh, and to this day, I mean, it's, 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 it's around, it's a lifesaver. When, when was that? When did it, when that come in? God, I'm terrible with history. I want to say like the 1930s, but that's a swag. Oh, it goes that far back. Well, we used to take, yeah. didn't we take insulin Maybe from animals and give it to 50s. people at first? Uh, probably so. I yeah. didn't know it went that far back. Yeah. Oh, I I'm sorry. That. I don't have the hard drive. I've looked it up. I just don't remember, uh, remember that, but, um, I have it written down somewhere. If I didn't include it in the book, I, I, I have it written down somewhere. But uh, so that was the very so that was the very first. Well, there's a lot of levers to find out oh, wow. how to do that, right? To to replace insulin, and so I think that led to the beginnings. And I don't even think they knew in the beginning, if I remember correctly, that it, you know it was a peptide. Again, I apologize. I don't remember the history, but um, it lost favor. I want to say peptides in general, not insulin, but I want to say the '70s or '80s. Because in general, peptides, which by the way, are just, uh, there's a, a formal definition and there's uh, some conflicting definitions, but roughly 50 amino acids in a, in, in a group are a peptide. And above that, it's a protein. But, you know, some people refer to growth hormone as a peptide and growth hormone is 191. That, that's know, all like, it is, is it 15 amino acids? No, up to 51. Up to 50, sorry. Oh, yeah, up to yeah. 50. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And in a particular sequence. It's just sequence. a classification. I mean, call yeah. it whatever you want to call it. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that is that closely related to a protein, though. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't it's know just, that. Yeah, it's just a shorter protein, if you will, huh. right? A, a smaller grouping of amino acids. But the, the upshot is, you know, well, the reason why they lost some favor in terms of research is because they were so, so short acting. Okay, and insulin is great. And of course, they have some longer acting insulins that made the insulin even better. But uh, some of these other purposes was like, okay, like kisspeptin is a perfect example. If you want to replace uh, endogenous production of testosterone, not replace, that's the wrong word, but if you want to enhance it, you can use HCG, mm -hmm. which is a homologue of LH, luteinizing hormone, or you can use kisspeptin. Well, kisspeptin takes, you know, four injections a day. Because oh, yeah. it's such a short-acting peptide. No one's going to do that. The effectiveness, forget about the efficaciousness, the effectiveness is going to suck because no one's going to do that four times a day. Right. Know? Right? So anyway, now we found that we can we can put some extra chains on these that in, improve their longevity. Okay, like going from Samorlin, which was one of the first, it used to be called Jeref, growth hormone secretagogues. Now we have longer ones like epimorlin, uh, well, that's a bad example, CJC-1295, which is a growth hormone releasing hormone, not yeah. a, a different mechanism uh, that makes it even better. And then we have improvements upon that, peptidomimetics, and now I'm getting off a little bit again, I'm sorry, but ibutamorin or MK677, which has a really long half-life, comparatively so, and makes it way more effective for getting your body to produce its own growth hormone. So uh, with peptides, the cool part, I think, is that, and I can remember being in, in medical school over at, uh, or pre-med at CSUN and seeing in the physics department, all over the walls, all these peptides uh, that were drug candidates and stuff. And I'm thinking, why is that in the physics department? Well, because really we're talking about structure. I liken it to, uh, do you remember, you guys are way too young for Tinker Toys? No, 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 remember Tinker Toys? Yeah, okay, yeah. so I don't have to explain. Yeah. Think about that. You can take these peptides and put them together to your heart's content in terms of your imagination any way you want. And the structure is the key because it fits, you know, like, a, like just like a key into a lock a certain way, depending upon the structure of those teeth. Same thing with the Tinker Toys. And so I think this is a huge area for what we'll call drug development, peptide development, right? Because we're going to figure out what works, what, what this lock, the, the key for this lock will work even better, you know? So what are some of the biggest, since insulin, what are some of the biggest breakthroughs that we've seen? In the Because now, and I feel like it, for, for at least for my experience, it, it got really popular at the same time as SARMs. And I feel like a lot of people lump peptides and SARMs together, even though I know they're different because it got popular 
at least that's what I what I've experienced and seen and on the internet like everyone talking about it so a lot of people think that yeah and along those lines it's, I think it's they, well, I know why they became popular at the same time because they there's like a gray market where people can buy them as research quote unquote research chemicals requiring no doctor supervision no prescription and they have real effects in the body so first off SARMs are different than peptides yeah totally and I think you know it's kind of a loaded question because you know, how do you determine the answer to that question? I, I think the reason why it's become popular is because of the gym crew. The gym and athletics is a great proving ground for a lot of these things because you either win or you don't. It either works or it doesn't. That group is, 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 is a very scrutinizing group. They're very critical. The explanations for why it works are sometimes <laughs> hilariously <laughs> ludicrous. I mean, you know. <laughs> that but that truth? aside, the yeah. testing ground is a good one. Yeah. Uh, so I think you find a lot of these things related to body composition, you know, yes. muscle strength and, and and performance. And that's why they kind of came up together because that that area is looking for anything that will enhance performance. So my, my first experience was with the BPC-157. Uh, my buddy, uh, Jordan Shallow and Ben Greenfield were the ones that turned me on to it when I tore my Achilles and it blew my mind how effective it was. And so that was my first like real introduction to it. Would you consider that one of the, like if we were to say since insulin, what are some of the biggest breakthrough peptides right now? Cause I know there's a whole host of them. What would you say are some of the biggest groundbreaking ones? Well, again, yeah, it's arguably dependent upon what your focus is. So, so in the, in the world of, you know, uh, sports and rehabilitation, regeneration, even, you know, that, that gastric uh, juice derivative, okay, it has done wonders for, and this is all anecdotal, by the way, it's kind of a bummer because and this is the way it works. We don't have any fantastic studies yet. We're you know, prospect, prospective, double blind, random placebo control, all that kind of stuff. Um, but anecdotally, yeah, like your story and so many others, it works great. The studies we have so far, are animal studies, it shows that BPC-157 works great for repairing tendons, uh, joints, skin, and really it works great with uh, well, gastric juices, duh, for IBD and IBS too. And you can use it gut locally. Stuff. Yeah. Well, systemically, you can't poke your gut per se. You but, take you know, it like a pill or you squirt in your mouth? Funny you say that because, yeah, you can use it orally. Uh, it would only, you know, hit the first part of the, presumably the first part of the gastrointestinal tract. But systemically, it's going to go through your bloodstream and hit the, the lower too. So people have used it for that successfully, presumably. Again, I don't have the studies to prove it. No, nobody does. But that that's one that has worked brilliantly so far. It looks like that's 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 a great one. So if you with, if you don't have if we don't have the studies really to prove this stuff, and we're kind of in this test phase, how how is it possible that you guys are allowed to prescribe it? Then how can you get away with doing that if it's if we haven't? It's a good question. Out? I think there's a lot of gray area there. Uh, one thing we do is we just we we go through pharmacies. Okay, none of this uh, research chemical stuff, which. I don't even know a lot. I don't want to know it because we have a pharmaceutical outlet, so we'll use it. And, and there's a- there's They have a, completely different regulations. They have to be very strict with their standards. Yeah, all, all the material has to be tested through the parties that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the research chemicals have third-party testing and it's just as pure. I don't know, but- Doubt it. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a um, triad of care, manufacturer, um, uh, doctor, and pharmacy that, that is kept intact- and, and, and so I, you know, I, I trust the pharmacies. I don't, again, I don't want to say anything bad, but I just, you know, I have a license, so yeah. I, I need to do things. That, so that even to get right into way. the pharmacy though, I would think there would have to be some sort of research around it to know that it's safe and that it's not like there's, is it that wise? Because we're talking about just a bunch of amino acids. It's so low. There's some the peptides that, that will not be on the market that are not available in a pharmacy that we can talk about. Like for example, uh, as far as I know, you can't get uh, Follistatin 344 in a pharmacy right now. And yet that one's great for the gym guys because it helps block myostatin. Oh, wow. Or sorry, sorry, so, uh, agonizes, sorry. Wow. Agonizes myostatin so that you can help build muscle tissue. Uh, there are others, though, that have been around for a long time, the thymosins. Thymosin um, alpha-1, uh, thymosin beta-4, uh, Zadaxa is a brand PT-141, uh, Valisi, I think is the- is So the why haven't these made it in the pharmacy? What's the- Well, they have. The, oh, the they ones have. that I'm talking about, they, they oh. actually have come out as brands, and now we have the generic form available in the pharmacy. So some are available. Oh, okay. Some are not. I would say, like, for example, the one that's, that's it's odd to me, 
to your point is Ibutamorin because I haven't seen that one listed as a brand anywhere, and yet you can get it at uh, any pharmacy, any compounding pharmacy that I know of. And that's the peptidomimetic I was talking yeah. about. In terms of groupings, the the ones that have gotten the most favor, the ones that seem to be the most popular, uh, are, are the GH secretagogues, ibutamorin, epamorlin, CJC twelve ninety five. Used to be uh, GHRPs. Um, they had GHRP two and six. But as of two Mays ago, uh, the FDA pulled those off the market and you can't get those at a pharmacy anymore. So there, there is some gray area there. I, I, yeah, I agree. Now, would you say that's because, you know, those all impact growth hormone and growth hormones probably like what everyone considers the fountain of youth. I mean, it just kind of improves everything, makes everything better. Is that why? From what I understand from the pharmacies explaining it to us, it has to do with the bulk compounds and what's been approved to be manufactured on this particular list by a pharmacy. So, yeah, I mean, again, I don't want to start anything with anybody. Uh, you know, government is what it is. And, 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 you know, there's a, there's a, there's a thought process that goes on there, which is to the benefit of the public, but oftentimes in the details, you know, things go awry. Uh, they want to make sure that the, the, the public's not being poisoned. Right. I get sure. it. But sometimes you go, there's no rhyme or reason to why they would pull, for example, GHRP two and six, but not pull the rest or let the rest stay along with GHRP two and six. So I can't respond to that because that's not my bailiwick. That's not my field. Gotcha, I go gotcha. with what the pharmacy tells me, but yeah, sometimes you just go, what? I, so I, I have experience with Ibutamorin with, through you guys. And, uh, I mean, it definitely works. I, I was, uh, I, I put on muscle with it quite, um, visibly. I could feel it. So it's definitely doing something, um, and but I would not want to do something like that without getting monitored by a doctor because it's making my growth hormone go up, and I don't know what my insulin's doing or my blood sugar, how it's responding, or what else is going on. I see people taking these things and have no doctor supervision. I think that's that's crazy. Well, let me back up and say I'm a registered libertarian. So you know, <laughs> if starting from that point, I, I I could go. I mean, teach their own is my point. But I but I think I wouldn't want to do it without a doctor looking at everything. And I'm with you. Yeah, I would choose as a registered <laughs> libertarian to have it done through a doctor. <laughs> and 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 so you know, stepping forward from that statement, I totally agree. And and I think that's that part of I just don't want to be told to do it. I guess of I'm course. Yeah. But I agree Same with here. you because it can raise blood sugar. Uh, and there are certain of those GH secretagogues that will raise aldosterone and cortisol. Ibutamorin, by the way, doesn't raise cortisol, so it's great. Uh, there are some side effects with it uh, because it works through the ghrelin pathway yeah, that make you get it hungry. Yeah. Uh, but there's things you'd want to know about. And certainly if you were, say, uh, someone who had prostate cancer, extant prostate cancer you're dealing with, or skin cancer, you know, you wouldn't want to be taking growth hormone. And so we might want to, well, we would just say, well, you shouldn't do IBM more if you have it. If you don't have it, but you're at the age where if we tested you for it, the likelihood that the test will be fruitful. In other words, you know, at 30, you know, what are you testing for melanoma for? It's pretty low chance or colon cancer, whatever it is. At age 50, you go, that's a higher yield test. Let's test you first for some of these cancers that would respond to growth hormone and make sure you don't have it before we give it to you. Right, right. You, you you mentioned another one called PT one four one. So I so I you know work with one of your associates, and you know as we're talking, I'm like he's telling me all these different products and compounds and peptides, and he talked about this one, and this is a libido boosting uh, compound, mm -hmm. not like uh, Viagra or Cialis that you know just Two increases blood flow. Yeah. Right, right. This literally increases your libido. So, I, so he says, do you want to try it? So of course, let me, you know, send, send me some, let me give this a shot. <laughs> so I got excited. Man. And it's, it, I mean, it's weird. It, it actually, really is I, weird. Look, I looked up, it has a bunch of other positive effects from it too. And even, even like, I think this is the one that did your skin get, can get tan from it too. Right? Well, that's initially yeah. why they developed uh, it was yeah. for that. Right. Is that, am I yeah, correct? It's a cool story. Uh, the guy, I'm not going to remember his name. I want to say it was Mick Hayward or something like that, but I, I just probably screwed it up. But um, he was, developing melanotan 2, which was, uh, it works on melanocortin uh, system, the uh, melanocortical, uh, what yeah. And, and that that's to improve your, your tanning ability. And the idea was for someone like, you know, from English descent, very fair skinned or something. And I think they, they actually sold the patent to Australia where they have a lot of English okay. immigrants who started Australia, you know, 
uh, with this fair skin to protect you from sun damage. So you can get a tan without having to go in the sun. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, sounds, sounds good. But anyway, the guy who invented it used uh, double the dose. This is the way the story goes. And I, I'll screw it up, but you guys can look it up online and, and it's told somewhere. Double the dose and had like an eight hour erection, <laughs> which, you know, you go, well, that's great. I guess if you're, you know, in Las Vegas somewhere, and yeah. you, you, you got a lot of money it's to spend, useful. but yeah. uh, eight hours still seems like a long time. But the problem was it also made him nauseous. Uh, and I, he was vomiting, not just nauseous. He, he, he was vomiting too. So anyway, that's where he said, oh, well, this is working because it obviously also helped his libido. And then they developed a product called, I think it's called Valisi. It's a brand. Again, going back to some of these that are already branded. Uh, and they marketed it to females for some reason only, but it works for guys too. And it, it works neurochemically, not just, it does help with um, uh, erectile function, but not, as you said, not like the not, nitric oxide, yes. like, not like a PTE five inhibitor, like Viagra, Viagra or something like that. Stuff. Yeah. Um, but like even uh, if you noticed, you know, uh, uh, dogs in estrus will, will have uh, an increased lordotic curve. I mean, really, like if you ever try it, you go, "How come my back is flexing like that?" It's, it's really weird. It is really weird. Uh, so it works on libido for both guys and gals and erectile function for men. It, it's a pretty cool treatment. It, it actually yeah. lasted for, for me, because I've tested it now a few times. It's like 48 hours. Like I noticed it for like two days, the increase in the libido for me. And I use a small, I use a very, it very did small. some amount. other thing, or at least the, the article, I think Katrina found some stuff on some of the positive like benefits. No, for, remember I told you for yeah. getting pregnant and stuff. That was what fascinated her. I was telling her about it. She was reading up on it, and she was saying there were some benefits for her trying to get pregnant from using it. What maybe, would that maybe be? Maybe because you have more sex? No, 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 no. It, it, it was something Increase else. Increase the odds, right? One no, you're one. right. And I'm sorry, I just I don't have the hard drive space. That's why I keep a lot of notes. But um, it, you're it, correct. There's probably about a half dozen things yes. in addition to what we've talked about, whether it be an antioxidant effect or – because remember, it's working uh, you know, neurochemically – as well as physiologically on the genitalia. So th there are other benefits to it for sure. Yeah, and this yeah. is something that you use like you, like four times a month. Like you're on a weekend, you're hanging out with your wife or girlfriend, whatever. Presumably you could use as much as you want. Yeah. Uh, you have to give yourself some lead time, as I recall. And that typically lasts typically four to six hours. But, you know. I noticed the facts, yeah, like 24, 48 hours. One of the things I remember is, because um, I test out I want to say everything. I don't want to misspeak, but I think I've tested out anything because I got to, it's my job, right? Right. Yeah. But I can remember sitting in uh, the passenger seat of a car and, you know, pardon me, you know, popping wood and going, okay, this is not good, man. Because <laughs> it does last longer for some people than four to six hours. And that can be inconvenient. What is the lead time for? What would you say? A couple hours. I heard you just say one to four hours. They'll, the, the literature says like, yeah, two to four hours. I'd say half an hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that was me. That was me about 30, 45 minutes. Yeah, I've, 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 I actually felt better at giving a little more lead time. Did you? Yeah, yeah. So I messed with it like at a half hour, hour, four. And then when I give it like two hours or four, I felt like the- No like, nausea? No, nothing at all. I got a little yeah. flushing, a little yeah. skin flushing in the, in the face. I noticed the skin thing too. Like I noticed like the, like the normally, like in the way I noticed was I was, I was in the sun and I, you know, I obviously have been in the sun a bajillion times growing up. And so I have an idea of like, oh, when I'm in the sun for a half hour, hour, I get a little bit of, I got like double the color I would normally get. That's the That's one what I noticed. People that don't want to get tan will say, I, I can't use this as often as I'd like because oh, it's, I think, I think it's a hydroxyl uh, uh, ligand for all the nerds out there. I think it's only one ligand different than the melanotan too. Okay. So you do have that tanning side effect. And for some, uh, you take on, if you use too much melanotan or this product, you take on almost a grayish look rather than oh, a darker look. So. I mean, I really liked it because I very, it was very minimal time I had to be in the sun and I felt like I got double the benefits <laughs> yeah. for the tanning. Well, so. you know what happens too, though? So, like where you have dark spots, uh, sunspots, I guess they call them. They'll make those darker than ever too. Uh, so it's just like having complaint. more, it's like having more melanin. Yeah. yeah. So now what about, okay. So you guys also work with oxytocin. I did not know this until recently. Now, this is not like Pitocin that they give pregnant women. This is, this is. Well, Pitocin is the actual chemical that's being released. Oxytocin is, is, uh, you know, what we're, what we're making to, to do something so, similar. So now what is it? Is it a nasal spray? Is it an injection? And how does it, and it, this is like the love bonding chemical. Yeah. So, I have yet to try it, but I, I I'm, so I one of the reasons to. why women will produce this is because, 
the theory goes that it, it, it helps with the bonding to the, you know, you, you, you go through this tremendous trauma of giving birth yeah. and then you've got this thing, you know, this baby and you got to continue taking care of it, even though you're exhausted and, you know, it was very painful. Well, it helps you, uh, attach to the baby and and feed it i mean this is just theory and who knows well but. along those lines is there a connection to uh women that have that what's a what's the word i'm looking for were they autism no 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 no. where oh. women don't want to be with their baby afterwards is there a suppression potentially of the theories are yeah. depression yeah, yeah where they where that's they're, more postpartum depression I think. yeah yeah is it connected it's, it's to all higher. the oxytocin though like if they're not developed if they're not producing very much of it is there been anything well around? if they haven't uh breastfed because I, I should say that that activates it breastfeeding itself i should i should have said activates oxytocin release so it encourages i guess the active it encourages and you got to get it started i guess to, to to further it but yeah if you're autistic apparently uh you don't react to oxytocin so that could happen for I guess a female who has, I don't, I don't know. I haven't read the did, research. Did you not, not this oxytocin that you guys work with? Is it, is, how does it, how does this administer? Well, the, the, the first, uh, administration was, well, of course, uh, intravenous and they use it, uh, Pitocin, I should say to, to, uh, clamp off the blood supply to the, um, to the uterus and, and, you know, the, the placenta, you want to remove the placenta and you want to stop any bleeding. There, sure. Right. Um, but for bonding, uh, they started using it nasally, inter an intranasal spray. They've tried larger doses because of the difficulty absorbing it, uh, sublingually. And I found, uh, clinically that it, it's kind of a, honestly, it's a crapshoot as to, you know, people either, you know, presumably have plenty of oxytocin. And so if you add more, what's the difference, right? Mm. Uh, there, there is a oh, S curve to it. And don't they say, well, I don't know as much difference. And then there's others that go, wow, that made all the difference. You know, my wife and I are getting along so much better or my husband and I are getting along so wow. much better. So really, yeah, I don't think it's that it's ineffective so much as that there's just some people that are short in it, like anything else, you know? So I mean, if, you're, was, if you're deficient or whatever, you're going to notice a, a better term, yeah. then, then you would notice a difference. It's and like people, are, and people are telling you, yeah, we use this and I just feel like I'm happier, more, I want to bond, I want to cuddle, I want to right. be more connected. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Very interesting. And it's, and it's, and it's intranasal, so it's like a spray? Intranasal, I think, is the most effective from what I've found, but they've gotten the, uh, the ODT tablets uh, to a point where they've got enough of a concentration, uh, enough strengths so that you can use it that way too. And people will experience benefit. But I would say, and maybe it's because it's faster acting. I don't know, but the intranasal spray tends to work the best. The problem is that it's, 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 um, it's harder to, to keep. You have to keep it refrigerated and that oh, actually you should keep it always refrigerated, but the intranasal spray is a little bit more, uh, uh, fragile. We'll call it. Okay. Yeah. I see. Now back to the, the growth hormone peptides and secreted gods. How much do they raise growth hormone? Could you compare this to taking actual growth hormone? So like if you were to use ibutamorin, for example, would that be comparable to using like a, you know, one or two IUs, for example, of growth yeah. hormone? Yeah, okay. I mean, oh, to a wow, degree. Really? You're not, you, well, you can compare them to answer your question technically. Okay. Yeah. So that, you know, you can get your IGF-1 up into the 300s, 350s. I've seen a 460 before, which you would think is physiologically impossible because to answer the question, typically you're going to get the equivalent of two, sorry, three to four IUs of exogenous growth hormone. Wow. Okay. But it's going to be limited by what we call the negative feedback loop because your body's producing it. So yeah. you could take three, four tab or capsules of ibutamorin and your body's going to say, talk to the hand. Got it. Uh, you know, th th it's enough. You have this negative feedback loop affecting uh, your ability to produce more. So, in that way, you could argue that you're staying within the natural for whatever that means, because you know how I feel about that. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. natural gets sick and die one day. We don't know if that's ideal or not, right. but you're going to get to what you had when you were, say, 20. And I consider if you don't get up into the 300s, that's treatment failure. But to answer your question, yeah, the maximum and what you should expect using one of these secretagogues should be the equivalent of, say, three or four IUs of growth hormone. You're not going to get the effect of, you know, a bodybuilder dose of, sure. or, or say an HIV treatment dose of say nine IUs twice a day or something like that. It's not so happen. I had a, I, my mother-in-law actually used to take uh, growth hormone and a very mild dose. And they, her and her husband for years did it, absolutely loved it. She's always asking me about it. 
And um, would this be something, she's in her 60s, would this be something that she could take and that would be great for her? Presumably, yes, because as long as your pituitary is still working, you should be able to encourage it, if you will, to, to grow, uh, yeah. not to grow, excuse me, to, to produce more. And, and what happens is, the fancy word is, um, you, you um, what is the fancy word? Uh, well, anyway, you, you regenerate the, the uh, pituitary so that you can use a lesser dose with time. And that was proven by Dr. Richard Walker a long oh, wow. time ago. He was involved in the JEREF development, the, what, what became Samoral and, and generic. Um, uh, but that's, and then, you know, the beauty of that too is when you go off it, you're not starting at zero and waiting for your body to restart. You're actually here and, you know, at a much higher dose, not super physiologic, but super physiologic. So it comes back down to whatever a 60 year old would have been producing uh, if she stopped. Um, yeah, I noticed um, my, well, I mean, all the stuff you're supposed to notice, but I definitely noticed skin and nails quite a bit, along with, of course, strength and sleep and all that stuff. But it was a, it was a real nice, mild, and I've not used it a couple times, uh, the ibutamorin. Well, what's, you're not old enough yet, but one of the cool things I enjoy about anything that raises the growth hormone levels is that, you know, as you get older, you, you desiccate, right? You, you dry out. Oh, so I, I think, the, you know, it's estimated we're about 70% water when we're first born. And then if you make it to 80, you're about 50% water, oh, right? I didn't know that. Uh, so some of what we attribute to muscle gain, I will tell people, is not actual muscle fibers being, you know, grown, but rehydrated, if you will. You know, you're putting water back in the cell where it's supposed to be. It's the so pump. if you, yeah, well, eh, yeah. But, but so also when you get on the scale and you're measuring your body composition, that's going to be attributed to muscle. Got it. Not fat, right? And so, um, uh, anyway, it's, it's a great way. It's a very safe way to do it. Not only because, you know, one of the arguments is that, and again, I'm just going natural versus unnatural. I'm not saying one's better than the other. You know, you've got a, a more square curve with exogenous, whereas the, you know, you're encouraging your pituitary to make its own because the word I was looking for is you've recrudesced the gland. And so it's going more along its natural cycle of, uh, and curve of, of, of uh, release. Uh, but you can't overdose on it if that's possible. Now that is possible because that's really the definition of acromegaly where, you know, someone has a, for example, a tumor on the gland, the pituitary gland, and it's causing you to produce too much. And you get the, the swollen, uh, not the swollen, but the enlarged features, you know, uh, you familiar with acromegaly? Yeah. Well, Andre uh, the giant. Giant yeah. Yeah. Giantism. Giantism, yeah. yeah. That's, that's no bueno. So you can overdose on it. So with J secretagogues, you're protecting yourself against that. Got it. Presumably. Wow, that's mm. fascinating. And you, have, you guys haven't tried that one yet, have you? I have. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. I no, noticed, I'm you know what I noticed on it was it. A deep sleep. I felt my sleep improved. Like your dreams, right? Just in general. I just yeah. no, Was I, that with ibutamorin? Yes. Because that's, that's important to note because with some of these, you, you'll get a cortisol release, which will not help you sleep. Ibutamorin is uh, unique in the sense that it will not help uh, increase your production of cortisol, which is an adrenal hormone, which, yeah. you know, is when you're under stress. So- yeah, a lot of people say that about exogenous growth hormone and and those GA secretagogues in general that don't have that cortisol release that come with it. Yeah, it helps sleep. Yeah, I just felt it, that was one of the, that was of all the things I noticed the most actually. I was like, man, when I take this, I sleep really well. Now, so, so. what about the cognitive enhancing ones? Like, I hope I'm saying this right. Selanc is that one? And uh, yeah, Selanc and Simax those those work interestingly uh, to calm you. And one of the theories behind. Uh, cognitive dysfunction, uh, including Alzheimer's, is that we spend, you can overdo it. You can overexcite a nerve. And if there's in an, an excess of NMDA excitation, glutamate uh, release excitation, we think it damages the, 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 the brain, the nerves. And so even though you go, wait a minute, this is something that's calming, it's going to make me think better? Yeah, because you can overdo it. And so the, the Simax and Selenc, the theory goes, helps you, you know, stay more calm and, and better focused. So they call it a nootropic, but a lot of people use it as what we call an anxiolytic, something that reduces anxiety. There's also uh, cebralicin, cebralicin um, that has been shown to, and by the way, most of the studies have been done uh, out of Russia. Uh, not that that matters, but you know, the you got to find translations, right? Uh but uh, cebralicin has also been shown to help with Alzheimer's. Um, the, the mechanisms with Selenc and Simax are different. With cebralicin, you're actually 
uh, opening up, uh, the theory is that it's, it's opening up the blood vessels and helping, you know, get more flow to the brain and, and, the, and the places where it needs it. Interesting. So what's the process if somebody wants to work with you guys and work with like peptides and some of these other compounds, they still do full blood panel. They, you still go over, you know, what your goals are and then let's try these and let's monitor you. Like, what does that look like that process? Well, it depends upon the peptide we're talking about. Like I mentioned earlier, if someone is, you know, my age and they say, Hey, I want to do something to increase my growth hormone. Fortunately, we have a product on the market. Now we used to have Oncoblot that went off to China. Long story behind that after Dr. Moray spent at least 38 years of his life de developing it. But uh, Grail has developed Galeri, which can detect uh, 50 different cancers. So we might say for, for GH secretagogue, not at your age, but certainly again at my age where there's more likely to be cancer present, let's test you first, just to be on the safe side. Sure. Um, and yeah, uh, um, anything worth doing is worth doing right. I have been accused of over-testing many a time. I've heard from patients about phlebotomists going, oh, you went to him, sit down. We might have to do this in two sessions because they're drawing so much blood. But but why not? If nothing else, you're getting a baseline. And I don't mean to treat medicine like an engineer would, but when we're dealing with manipulating all those things, it just makes it, um, I think it's a good idea uh, to have that information in, in, in the interest of being prudent also to have that information before we go further and know, uh, know what, we're, what we're jiggering. If nothing else, to know whether it's working for you. For example, you know, somebody who wants to improve their fertility with HCG, well, let's find out where we're starting first. I mean, just to give you a simple example, go get a semen analysis. Where are you? Then we'll put you on the, the treatment and then see where you end up. Yeah. This is why we work with you guys, because I, I wouldn't recommend or refer anybody to do uh, any exogenous hormones or work with peptides unless they're working with someone who has a lot of integrity um, and who's going to who's gonna watch all these things because they are efficacious. You're not just taking vitamin C, you know, you're taking something that really affects hormones and chemicals in the body. And without that, without really measuring the baseline and then monitoring, I mean, you could, you know, who knows, it could be the person could have great results or not so good results, but we don't know unless we test. Well, we, and why guess when you can test and just yes. to add to that too, I mean, and not to counter what you said at all, not really at all. But it's funny you say that because, you know, we treat vitamin C like it's innocuous. It's not. Sure. If you give somebody with uh, a history of kidney stones, vitamin C, for example, without giving them uh, some uh, concurrent, uh, like in, 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 acet in acetylcysteine, they're going to have a problem. So, you know, where we draw the line as to what's supposed to be followed with a doctor and not as arguable, again, as a registered libertarian, hey, to each his own. But as a doctor, I would encourage you to encompass all that. And we do in our practice because there is synergy there with all these things. Vitamin C is an important part, you know? Yeah. And, and again, not to, not to counter what you said, it's just, I understand your point, but I got to throw in there that all these things make a difference so that if we can get our arms around as much of it as possible, we have more that we can jigger. Yeah. Well, our... Part of our motivation or the the main part of the motivation to even have this episode is we've been extremely transparent with our audience since the beginning of this show. And one of the things we all agreed on too is that, you know, we're always going to promote to our, our base, like the big rocks, you know, the sleep, the eating correctly, exercise, building muscle, all that stuff comes first. But then yet here we are, you know, behind the scenes using peptides with you. And I think we all felt like I think it's uh, only fair to be authentic with our audience because we've been that way since day one to share with them that we're actually doing some of this stuff and experimenting with it and have somebody like you come on who can speak to them on who and why and uh, why you should or shouldn't do certain things because we've been experimenting with that. So that was a lot of why we wanted to do this because... I, I don't think it's right for us to be, you know, utilizing some of these things and then acting like we don't. Or no, no, we've always been open. But, you know, back to your vitamin, you know, uh, what you said about vitamin C. You know, it's funny when people ask us what vitamins they should take. We always tell them, get tested and see what you're deficient in and then supplement with that rather than throwing everything but the kitchen sink <laughs> at yourself. Well, if you read the and label of every vitamin. supplement, you'd be taking every everything under yeah. the sun. And, yeah. and I use the example with B12 that I wear out, and pardon me if I'm repeating myself, but, you know, people, including my wife, you know, when she was running track, she would go to the, especially if they went out drinking the night before, they go to the trainer and get a B12 shot. 
And some people, as you know, would swear by B12 and some people not. If you've got plenty of B12, a B12 shot's not going to do anything for you. If you're short in it, yeah, you're going to feel it. One thing I can tell you, everybody, and remember I was a CPA before I was a doctor, so I'm presumably honest and conservative. Everybody <laughs> I meet needs more of the B vitamins, okay, and, and, and D3. 300 years ago, life expectancy was what, 30, 35? Okay, and you're herding sheep, no stress. They call them the stress vitamins, by the way, the B vitamins. Nowadays, you wake up with stress. You, half the population sleeps with stress. And so you need these B vitamins. And even more to my point, what happens when you take B vitamins? You pee yellow green, right? The riboflavin passing through you, which just goes to show you, it doesn't stick to you very well. You need to take it more frequently. And just a quick reminder for the nerds out there to convert food into usable energy, the Krebs cycle, right? Uh, they call it the citric acid cycle now. You need magnesium, zinc, coenzyme Q10, manganese, and all the B vitamins. So sometimes people will feel better just by adding that to the regimen. It's not innocuous, man. Do you, guys, do you guys work with you guys work with vitamins as well, right? So absolutely, yeah. So I mean, this is like full stop. You guys are looking at everything, and you can work with nutrients. You can work with peptides. You can work with hormones really optimizing someone's quality of and life. And there's some things you can test for. Like you can get uh, vitamin D, unfortunately, you can only test the the, the roadway. You can't taste uh, uh, test, you know, you can't count how many people live in the house. You just have to gauge it based upon how many people are driving in and out. Serum levels, in other words. Uh, vitamin B, ditto for a lot of them. Not even worth testing because nobody gets enough, as I said. But magnesium, we can test uh, by testing the red blood cells. And then from there... You do it based upon what I learned from you. You know, what, what do you do for a living? Are you construction or are you an accountant behind right, a desk? Right. You know, are you feeling a certain way? Are you after a certain goal? And, and then we can jigger things appropriately. I argue to some degree, everyone could take beta alanine. They'd be better for it. You ever heard of beta alanine? Oh, yeah, of course. It should be banned by, you know, water should ban it. It's, a, it's definitely an unfair advantage. And yet I don't think people take advantage of it. But whether you're trying to use it as an ergogenic aid, you know, to enhance your performance, or you're just using it as an anti-aging tool because it converts to L-carnitine, it's kind of a no-brainer. So some of those you can go, I call them the, the Chinese medicine has an idea of supreme herbs and supplements, things that you could take no matter what, like ginseng maybe. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the ones where you go, oh, we got to fix this. So like you're prone to infections. We're going to up your vitamin C and glutathione precursor, the NAC, and, and we can hit bugs that way. You, you mentioned B12 and you just reminded me of a question that I had. In fact, a friend was asking me, um, why take B12 injections and not just take the over-the-counter B12 pills? <laughs> panache of it. You know, it, it really, there is no reason. Some people <laughs> like the fact that they're, well, for one, you can do a thousand mics of, of vitamin B12 once a week. And by the next time, you know, in a, in a week hence, when it's time to give yourself another one, you'll be above normal. Guaranteed. Never seen it Absorbed. otherwise. So, you know, it's just, I guess, and for some people it's convenient, you know, there'll be periods where I'll be like, I'm done being a pin cushion yeah. and I'm taking all my stuff orally. And there'll be stuff where I'm done swallowing this stuff. I've worn out my GI okay. and I'll go back to whatever I can pin, okay. you know, yeah. but the I, same thing pretty much. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a conversion a roughly a tenfold conversion where like if I'm injecting, uh, 500 milligrams of L-carnitine, yeah. that's about five grams orally. Got it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Got it. And also, I, I would imagine people with gut issues probably have worsening, you know, have worse absorption yep. rates uh, with some of these things. I, I've worked with clients where supplementing with B12, it, it just, God, they'd have to take so much. They went to the injections and it worked really well. And that's because they had a lot of gut issues, gut yeah. inflammation. So it made a big difference. Makes sense. We go back to the individuality of it all. Yes, you totally. Know, that's why you, you really should. And I'm, and I'm not trying to pump up my profession or my job at all, mm -hmm. but- whether it's your job looking over what I would call the basics, you know, that you mentioned, the rocks, yeah. you yeah. call it. I mean, and this is not trying to, to, to blow sunshine your way either, but I mean, people overlook that and, and all the vitamin supplements in the world and or hormones is not going to overcome. Yeah. You're not exercising properly. You, you're, you're not resting properly and you're not eating properly. Yeah. Those are the rocks. Right. These are the additional things yeah. or the things that leverage that, that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you said that because that yes. that's, again, that's yeah. been our message since day one. That's even why we were really hesitant to even talk about peptides. We're like, we don't want to promote this to our audiences. Like, this is the answer to help you do this or help you do that when you're not doing the sleep, the exercise, the diet. So I'm glad yeah. you said that because that's a lot of like, but then at the same time, here we are using these things. So I felt like we should 
share that with our audience. But again, sticking with take care of the big rocks first. And then th these are other levers that we can pull in. But there was an article published that Dr. Todd sent me right recently um, where I guess there's some famous bodybuilders and I'm not up, I'm not hip to the latest and greatest guys out there, but saying, Hey, no, here's what I'm doing. So that doesn't occur so that the, you know, the younger, more naive uh, uh, of the population out there isn't thinking something unrealistic. I mean, really, guys, I mean, you know, and now I hate to sound like, um, you know, some of the, like Jamie Lee Curtis, who I love, by the way, but, you know, she's a big proponent of, hey, here's what I look like without makeup. But we need more of that because yeah. I think people are going too far with some of these things, uh, too far, maybe it's not the right word, but, but their expectations are off because they don't understand that, yeah, I mean, this person's using this and that and, you know, or this person works for a living, yeah. you know, and, and or this person doesn't work for a living, I should say, yeah. and spends his whole time in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you're going to have an extra edge, right? Yeah. yeah I, I think, uh, you know, if you if you do the main things, then you can augment and leverage. I love that word leverage with modern technology, science, and really improve the overall quality, especially when we talk about hormones, if you're deficient, that's totally different. It's like being deficient in a nutrient. Supplementing what that nutrient makes is a life changer. You know, I tested very low with testosterone. For me, you know, getting replacement was a, I mean, it was a game changer for me. Um, if my testosterone levels were fine, then it wouldn't have been necessary, but it made a huge difference. So especially in that case, uh, this is, this can definitely be the answer if you're deficient, but yeah, you gotta do all those other things first. So I'm really glad you said that. And of course, over, you know, after all, you are a fitness guy at heart. So <laughs> yeah, one of the things we love about you. Thanks for coming on the show. No, Thank my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. I really yeah. appreciate it. Good time. Always my pleasure. Thank you. This one's really important. And that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another yeah. thing. You'll see less injury as well.